our last chapter today, talent development. Yeah. Um, it's around the entire topic of training and development. Uh, we saw last time training is about short-term knowledge acquisition. Anyway, I, I, I need to have some knowledge about project management, so I do a course or something like this. While development is long-term. Here we talk about something like career, long-term development. And these are the guiding questions. How can companies ensure having success is ready for key positions at, at any time? What are key positions? For instance, leadership positions. Yeah. So it's really a challenge for companies always to have successors, Nachfolger, for those positions. Okay? And, 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 and for this, companies use criteria and methods to identify people which on the long run can fill those positions talents, high potentials, okay? And uh, we're going to talk about this, what companies do there. Uh, once companies have identified their so-called high potentials, and we will talk about what, what that is, once they have identified high potentials, the question is, what can companies do to develop these people over years into those positions? There is another term which is sometimes used in this particular context, which is talent management. Okay? So whenever you hear the term talent management, that in most cases applies to the question, how can we identify talented people and how can we develop these into these key positions? Okay? This is huge. Okay? This is not done over the weekend. These are really significant, large-scale programs. Um, as a kind of start, look at this example. This is from, from McDonald's. Okay? And, and you, you can see some, some kind of hierarchy. Right? On the bottom level, you see there are restaurant managers. And um, if you do well, Maybe you, you are invited or nominated to a restaurant manager development center. Okay. Uh, if you do well, you move to the next level and might join a young leader development program. And this is still local. This might, might still happen in Germany or in, in any other country. If you do well, you might move to the next level operations development program. So, so the people there are really talented, really strong, really motivated, really qualified. Uh, if you do well, you might get promoted to the next level. And now we talk about the Europe level. Um, and if you do well, you are invited to a European leadership development program. Uh, if you do well, then you get promoted might be to, to the top level. And, and you, you are nominated to a global leadership development program. And they are really the big guys, the future executives. Okay? So, so this is a typical example how, how, how global companies develop their people over different steps. Right? Uh, and, and to move from one step to another, companies very often have specific programs to prepare the people for the next level. And here I, want to, I would like to, to, to share with you uh, uh, a very simple concept which, which I want you to understand. If you get graduated, probably you, you, you start on a, on, a, on a lower level. Okay? And, and, and here on the lower level, who, who, whom do you manage? You manage yourself. You manage yourself. What does that mean? You have a job, you have certain responsibilities and things, and you just have to take care for yourself. Right? Yourself, you and your job. If you get promoted, whom do you manage then? You manage a team. Yeah? You might become a team lead. Huh? And, and, and now the question is, how does that differ 
On this level, you might be a sales representative selling things. Here, you manage a sales team. Is that a different job? Yes, of course. What, is, what are the major difference between managing yourself and managing a team? Yeah, well, you have a lot more responsibility. You have much more a responsibility in terms of what? In terms of making sure that sales are up <laughs> and yeah. you're doing, I don't know, the team does it the right way. You, you, you're not only responsible for your own sales outcome, you're responsible for the outcome of the entire team, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's harder to keep several people uh, motivated instead yeah. of only yourself. And, and they might be different. You know yourself, but yeah. they're different personalities. If you take care for yourself, you might have everything under control, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if you manage a team, you are responsible for people. Yeah? And you have to, 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 to coordinate these. You have to take care with conflicts, maybe. You have to hire people. You have to fire people. You have to make sure that, that the, the, the team works in a coordinated way, right? And, and or also, when you manage a team, you, you also have to coordinate your team with other teams, maybe. Yeah? So things get much more complicated. You start to lead people. It's not only that you do some tasks. You, you, you should avoid doing operational tasks. Yeah? You should not solve the problems as you did here. If you were a programmer, a software developer on this level, you solve problems. You, 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 you develop software. But if you are on this level, you should, should, you should stop develop software. You have the people doing this. Right? But you, you, you coordinate the people who, who do this and, and hope that at the end you have a joint result. And this is a totally different task. If you get promoted, from the team lead level to the next level, whom do you manage then? Team hmm? You manage team leaders. Yeah? Or as we used to say, you manage managers. What's special about this role? Is that different from being a team lead? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, you not only have a team, six, 12 people, which report to you, there are managers reporting to you. So, ah, that sounds scary. Managers. Um, the special thing about this role is you are somewhere in the middle, yeah? sandwich position. Yeah? You are not on the top, you are not on the bottom. You might be far off the operational processes. You, you, maybe you don't have a clue how to develop software. You don't have a clue how the people sell the products. You are far off the bottom line. Yeah? But you're still not the one who decide about strategy and things. So you're somewhere in the middle. Uh, you get pressure from, uh, from below. You get pressure from top. You, you, you have much effort to coordinate different teams you also have to coordinate between your department, your division, and other division, other departments. So that's also challenging. If you get promoted, you get to the next level. And what is there? You manage organizations. You manage organizations. That means you are responsible for the future of the organization. You are responsible for the, for the survival of the company. So, so that includes making decisions about what? The budget. The budget is already here. Yeah? But you also make decisions about budgets. <coughs> Strategy. You decide upon the future of the company, how to position the company in the market in the future. We stop producing these products, we start producing these products. We invest in China. We will buy this company. Okay? These are the large-scale decisions. There is another thing uh, you are responsible for when you are on the top level, which is what? Culture. Culture. Look at some companies, any company you like, and you will see that the culture, which, is, which you will find in certain companies, 
really reflect the thinking of the CEO. Think of IKEA. Yeah. The way how the people work and how they interact and how they communicate within IKEA really mirroring, is mirroring the thinking of the founder. Think, think of Apple. Think of any other company. And you will find that on this level you have a huge impact on how the people think. You have a huge impact on the values. You really define what is acceptable and what's not. Okay? Now, why do I show you this? I show you this because whenever we talk about careers, you must understand that when you move from one level to another, responsibilities change. And it could be that you re are really strong on this level. You are an excellent software developer. You are an excellent purchaser. You are an excellent sales representative. Does that necessarily mean that you are successful as a team lead? No, not at all. And we have seen a lot of managers fail. They were really great in their job. But once they become managers, they totally failed. So, so a, a really significant challenge for companies is to prepare the people for the next level. Okay? And to make sure that, that the people which we prepare are the right ones on the long run. Okay? So for companies, the question is really, I have people on this level. Which people here might be the future directors on this level? Okay? You have to predict the future about people. You must. I mean, as a company, you can't wait until you have some vacancies on certain level. Oh, we need a new head of finance. Or we need a new division head who is there. Maybe then it's too late. You have to prepare the people so that they are ready to move to the next level. Okay? And this is what we talk about today. It's going to be really relevant to you. If, you. if you want to succeed in your career, if you want to move to an upper position, it's interesting to understand how that really works. Okay? So there is uh, one picture which gives you a kind of overview. And I really, I really want that you can talk about this picture. Yeah? If I would show you this picture in the exam, maybe, yeah? you should be able really to explain this. Huh? How does that work? And I, I, will, I, will refer, I will refer to these different boxes throughout this session today. So this is a kind of overview. But for the moment, just let me give you... Uh, I would like to run through it, through this, um, to give you a complete understanding. And then we jump into uh, each of these uh, components one by one. Okay? So, to give you an overview. In the middle, we have something which we call a competency model. A competency model is something very simple. A competency model is, is a list of competencies of which we believe somebody should have to succeed in a job. Okay? For instance, I will show you an example, but for instance, strategic thinking. You should be able to think in strategic terms. If you are not able to do so, you are the wrong one on certain positions. So this is just about the question, what does somebody need? Which competencies should somebody demonstrate to succeed? Okay? So, this is in the middle, and with every component around this, companies always refer to this competency model. Now let's start uh, with the top one on the right-hand side, performance management. Again, we're going to talk about these components in more detail. But for the moment, uh, it's simply about two things. It's about performance appraisal and it's about objective setting. Uh, some of you who already worked somewhere know that uh, probably once in a year you had a conversation with your manager, maybe in January, where you talked about two things. One thing is how was your performance in the previous 12 months? 
Yeah? And what will be your objective in the upcoming month? Right? So this is, this, is, this is a moment, a conversation, a meeting between you and your manager where you talk about the past and where you talk about the future. And you talk about your performance and you talk about your objectives and uh, we talk about your future development. Okay? This focal point once a year. Okay? Then the next step is something which we call a talent review. A talent review is, is something where the managers, the top managers, get together and they talk all their people through and they think about at least about one critical question. And the question is, who are our high potentials? Who are those 5% of our employees which we really should support in the future so that we make them ready for key positions. Okay? So the result of the talent review is more or less a list of names, a list of, of who are our high potentials. Okay? Now let's say we have a company or a division where we have 1,000 people and after the talent review we have identified the 50 people which we uh, consider as high potentials. After this step, most companies uh, run a so-called potential assessment. So they have a closer look on those 50 people doing, uh, using uh, certain methods. Uh, for instance, like, like a kind of assessment center. Okay? They, they, as a high potential, you, you, you attend a high, uh, assess kind of assessment center, do different uh, tasks and tests, and interviews and the result of this potential assessment is you have a much more detailed understanding about the strength and the weaknesses of your high potentials and coming from there you think about okay what should the 50 people yeah what should these 50 people learn in the upcoming years maybe there is burned and we see oh burned is really strong in some areas but there are also some weaknesses and burned should gain more international experience. Where can you learn international experience? Where can you gain international experience? Other countries? Uh, In another country. <laughs> say, oh, let's, let's <laughs> assign burned to a job abroad. In Europe, right? probably. In Europe or in the States or somewhere else. Right? Ah, oh, there is Suzanne. She's strong in a lot of things, but her English is really weak. What to do? Send her to America. Uh, training to America. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so this is what you do after this step. You, you talk about training off the job, assign certain training methods, or, or and yeah, uh, assign some stretch roles. We're going to talk about stretch roles also in more detail. A stretch role is a challenge. Or in another term, it's a kind of cold water. So uh, the company is saying, in which cold water should we throw burnt? In which cold water uh, should we throw Suzanne? Okay. So, this is an annual cycle and, and companies hope that through doing this they have successors ready at any time for each key position. And, and, and to plan this, to have an overview about who going to be the successors for which position? This is done with succession planning. Okay? So, this is a kind of overview. Um, I used to show this picture sometimes in my presentations in front of HR directors. And I asked them, is this what you do? Is this <laughs> at least what you try to do? And, and usually they say, yes, exactly. This is... This is a common perspective in practice. Okay? So just as an overview, please, here's the question. What is succession planning? Succession planning, uh, yes. Uh, the point is, in a company you have some key positions. You might say that uh, the head of finance is a key position. The head of HR is a key position. The CEO, yeah, Vorstandsvorsitzender, is a key position. You have different key positions in a company. And the question is, do we have successors ready for these key positions? What if the head of finance will 
will leave the company, will die, get sick, or something else, or as we used to say, hit the truck. Uh, if this position of the head of finance suddenly becomes vacant, do we have somebody who is ready to fill this position? You know, companies need to have an understanding about this. They, 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 they don't want to be surprised. They, they don't want to start thinking about successor when, once they need one. Yeah? So succession planning is about always having an overview who is ready to fill which key position. Okay? Did that help? Mm -hmm. Good. So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Let's start in the middle. Competency model. What is a competence? What is the difference between a competence and a knowledge? <laughs> Good question. You choose the wrong place. Huh. Say knowledge is maybe you go to class, you learn some concepts and ideas like a theory, but you can't go out and do the job yet. In a competency, you have the knowledge and you can adequately do a job. Right. I think. So competence is always about solving a problem, right. Right? doing something. It's about really, um, it's about action. While knowledge, it's more theoretical. It's something that you have in your brain. Uh, as I said earlier, you might know how to change a wheel, but that does not necessarily mean that, that you can do it. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so competencies uh, are, are, uh, are, are a combination of, uh, let's say, different components. Yeah? Um, so here on the left-hand side, you see some components. Uh, competencies are made up of uh, experience. I have experience. Over the years I did some things. I were, I were uh, challenged with different problems. Um, I solved problems. Uh, I have some experience. But I also have some knowledge, theoretical knowledge. Uh, maybe you also have some, if not maybe, you, you have some predispositions like intelligence. Intelligence. Um, or, or physical strength. Yeah? Um, and you might have a personality that goes into a certain direction. <clears throat> personality is not, not necessarily... Uh, 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 personality, we can't say that, that you have a good personality or bad personality or a strong personality, weak personality. But <clears throat> for some jobs, it's better to have a specific personality. Yeah, if you... If you, uh, let's say, if, if, if you want to sell things, you're better off if you are kind of extroverted, mm -hmm. okay? It's not that it's better to be extroverted than introverted. That's no good or bad. Yeah? People are as they are, and that's fine. But for some jobs, it's better to have specific personality. So, so that's why I put personality also into this entire frame and define it here as a component of competence. So <clears throat> this is more the theoretical part. Um, Good question. Uh, the predisposition. That could, we could name that talent too, right? Because the talent is not <clears throat> something you really learn. It's something you have. It's, it's, it's a We're going to talk, talk about talent in more detail. Uh, I, I, would, I, I would not agree. You know, there is, is the point that predisposition is something like talent. Uh, here it's really about the competence which you have now. Right. Yeah, your ability now okay. to solve problems. While a talent, if you, if you have a talent in something, let's say in, uh, in uh, playing piano, that does not necessarily mean that you are strong in playing piano. We're going to talk about this. Yeah, now you are no, I confused. <laughs> I disagree. Yeah, I hope I can convince you. I mean, if you have a talent in something, that <coughs> normally means to me that you're good, you're better at it than the rest. Mm -hmm. That's what we think of. If you are talented in something, you are better than the others. <laughs> well, it's just not necessarily. We talk about it. We talk about it. Yeah. Um, to give you an example now, uh, let's think of uh, <coughs> Tiger Woods. Is yeah. he talented in playing golf? Certainly. Sure. Yeah. Yes, of course. 
in the age of one, did he have the talent? I don't know his life, no. but... Yes, of course, he had the talent. Well, yeah, he had the talent since his conception. He wasn't confident. Yeah, so it was defined by the DNA. <laughs> but that, at this age, he was not strong playing golf. Yeah, but he had... That's what I'm trying to say. Like, you have the predisposition. Like, you have the theory... The, it's yeah, in you your the genes. It's yes. inside of you. It's yes. sleeping inside of you, and you can wake it up. And that's what I mean by... You have the potential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have the that's potential. And that does not necessarily mean that now, at this particular moment... Mm -hmm. You are strong in it. I never said that, but mm. okay. <laughs> okay. We talk about it. We talk about it. We talk about it. <laughs> 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 okay. So this is an example of a competent small, a real one of a company named ABB. Do you know ABB? No. You should. <laughs> 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 uh, have you ever drove an ICE train? Yes. 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 If you try for the ICE, uh, a lot of ABB components are there. Yeah. In uh, in the former days, they made power plants. They made the huge things, really, uh, huge machineries. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, a huge company, um, Swedish Swiss company. There is a, a, a big plant in in Mannheim, for instance. Okay, big company, and they ask themselves, which competencies do our leaders need to succeed? Yeah. Um, and this is the outcome. They, they, they went through an intense process over years, over months, <laughs> uh, and they came up with this, saying, if you want to succeed as a leader, you must be result-oriented. You must always have the objective in mind. Yeah? Um, you are a customer and market oriented. You understand your customer. You think in customer terms. You have an understanding about the market, about the competitors and everything. And you can think strategically. You, you know what is important for the future in the upcoming years. You do not think only in details what is, re what is relevant right now. You can think about the big questions about the future of the company. You really are a team player. You are strong in collaboration. You are strong in working with others, individual on an individual level, but also on team level and department level. You are strong in developing people. Yeah, you are not only a teacher. You support people in their development. And you can lead people. Yeah. And the people, you have the competencies that make people follow you. Yeah, you, uh, you can give guidance, you, 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 you have visions, you have whatever. Uh, you can lead through changes, uh, especially the large-scale changes, through restructuring processes, through strategic changes, changes which might be painful for many people. Um, and you also have intercultural sensitivity. Right? You, 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 you have a sense of different cultures and how to act in different cultures and to succeed in different cultures. You also can lead uh, uh, diverse teams. Yeah? So, and, and these competency models are used as a kind of framework so that for every individual person, for every individual high potential, for every individual leader, you can think of whether or not somebody fits to such a model, as I pointed out in this picture. So you have a competency model saying, okay, which level from one to five is required? And here we have a very concrete position. So on the very concrete position in the middle, here the position senior specialist CRM, whatever that is, <laughs> um, we have added some, some competencies, and now we compare this competency profile with the profile of a, a, a particular person, Garth. Yeah. And here with Garth, we see, oh, with regards to creativity, he's better than required. Teamwork, he exactly meets requirement. Presentation, he's, he's a kind of weak. The same is with project management, but mobility is fine. SAP R3, he's better than required, and English is, is, is fine. So. Just to give you a rough idea um, how these competency models 
are used. Yeah? These are, again, framework to match people. Yeah? See, where do you have strength? Where do you have weaknesses? Are you mature enough to fill a certain role? Okay? So, again, such competency models are there to answer the question, what is required to succeed in a certain role? Here, leadership role. And that provides orientation, that provides guidance, that provides a frame for relevant decisions. Yeah? Where to support people, where to develop people, whom, whom should we select for a key position, who really meets these requirements. So, so this is the entire idea of competency model. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite simple. Right? It's simple. But the question now to you, is, is that reasonable? Is that reasonable? On the first side, we all probably would say, yes, of course. <laughs> if we want to fill key positions in a company, we need to understand what is required. If we don't understand what is required, how can I tell whether somebody is ready to fill such a position? So th that makes sense on the first side. But think about it. There are some reasons why we also can say this is crabby. That does not make any sense. Why? Because these are very, very dis uh, different aspects and maybe the person who is going to be promoted didn't have like enough experience in all of these fields because they are very, very different, like customer and market orientation <laughs> and then people development maybe worked in HR but doesn't have any idea about the technical stuff or whatever. So it's quite difficult to tell one person, okay, you have to know everything if you haven't done it before. So we struggle in thinking that every leader must be strong in really everything. Yeah? Isn't it okay if somebody is strong in some fields and maybe weak in some others? Yeah, we could think of this, right? Yeah, I agree. I, actually, I yeah. was saying to him as you were discussing all of the requirements that the only person that comes to mind who would fill all of these would be the president. And that's a pretty rare person to find, right? Not every single person could be a president. Yeah. But you think it's if, pretty if people try. <laughs> people try. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Not, so not there's the idea. If you think of, and uh, I like the idea right, to yeah. think about who might fit this model. Is there anybody in your mind who really fit this, this, this points? And uh, your idea is that it's only the president. There's a, a, a godlike creator that really fits these requirements, right? Yeah. So it sounds a little bit extreme, too perfect. Yeah? Um, there are some other points which I really want you to see on this. Um, it's a packed slide, I know, but I slowly gonna move through these four points. And point number one, what I want you to see. Is a strength always a strength? In some companies or in some situations, we know people which are really strong in strategic thinking, the strategic thinkers. They always know what's important in the next five years. But if you ask them, hey, Bernd, here's a problem. Uh, how to solve this now? They don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not that you always have to think in strategic terms. Maybe it's the balance between strategic thinking and operational thinking. And, and find this balance, finding what is relevant in which situation. That would make sense. Yeah? Teamwork. Is it, is, it, is it good to always be a team player? Whom of you uh, did ever sail? You mean did ever? Okay. So you did sail. Um, you know, there are some situations where you can't do a decision on a democratic basis. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. Yeah. Sometimes the skipper says, we do this. No discussion. You don't have time for a discussion. Yeah. This is my decision, whether it's wrong or right, we can discuss later. And it's the best thing you can do to really ignore the team. Just saying, this is our direction. 
in other situations, it's really important to discuss, to find a common sen- uh, to, to a consensus. Right? Is it always a strength to do what the customers want? No. Customer orientation. Huh? Nope. No? But this is what you have learned in marketing, right? Yeah, they say that customer is the thing, but it doesn't work all the time because they are so demanding and everybody wants something else. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you have to guide the customer. Yeah? Maybe. Uh, yes, here's the point. No, also if you have like, I mean, uh, sometimes you have really clever customers and um, if they feel like they can do anything, some start to play with you. That's really the thing. Okay. If you, if you mm-hmm. stop them, sometimes you have to stop them. Or every now and then you should stop them. To show them sometimes yes. you have to manage the expectations yes. of the customers. They know, no, it's... Oh, it's fine. Come on. Yeah. 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 No, uh, that's enough. No. No, it's, it's enough. Uh, I did enough for you. Uh, you know this quote, I really love it in this particular context from Henry Ford. Henry Ford, who once said, If I would have asked my customer, I should have built faster horses. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That's why the customer sometimes cannot think about your innovation. That's also a, a, a point of view of, of Steve Jobs, who always said, I don't care about what customers want. I define what customers want. That's, that's arrogant, maybe. He was right. Yeah. So customer orientation might not always be a strength. You must find the right balance between doing what you think what's good and what customers want. So these are just two examples about, is a strength always a strength? Uh, uh, does it depend on a situation and is it better to find the right balance between a strength and the opposite? Right? So it's not always that clear. Um, having a certain competence must not necessarily mean that the person in question actually uses it. Like McClelland, this was a leading professor of psychologist in motivation. He once said, uh, What if somebody can drink a lot of beers, but he doesn't? (laughs) Whatever that means. Uh, It's not always about which competences you have. Are you motivated to show these? Uh, You have a great competence to lead people, but do you really want this? So when we talk about competence, we should not ignore what the people want. Uh, we should not ignore their tribes. They, we should not ignore what's important to these people. Um, the third point is of, of major importance. Um, the idea with competency models is that you have to have a specific set of competencies in order to succeed. Right? But the point might be that it's not necessarily one specific set of competencies, but rather people can succeed with totally different set of competencies. Look at our faculty. I think in this faculty we have some professors which are quite good. I hope you agree. Now, if you think, if you think about two professors, only about two professors of which you think, yeah, they are strong. And now you compare these two professors, whomever you've chosen, they are different. They are very different in terms of their competencies. So one person succeeds because of this set of competencies, while other people succeed because of these competencies. So people differ. Uh, It might be that you can succeed in a challenge by showing totally different sets of competencies. The fourth point. Think about uh, successful teams. And the point is that you never succeed alone. You always succeed in a team. If we think of successful teams, maybe the Beatles. You know the Beatles? Uh, There was a boy group, a British boy group. (laughs) They, They totally differ. You could not say they all show the same set of competences. Of course, they all were were able to play an instrument. They all could sing, more or less, yeah. But uh, they were really different. And this difference 
made them so successful. Think about some management teams. Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. The one is the prototypic nerd. And the other, Steve Ballmer, is his, uh, his, his, his power. Yeah. Yeah. His power. And he's totally different from, 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 from uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates was the one who structured things. He, 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 he used his brain and Steve Ballmer used his heart. So, and the combination was great. The same with SAP. Dietmar Hopp, Hasso Blattner, totally different people. And that was good. The combination was great. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, totally different people. But the combination was great. So, so um, competency models are fine, but you don't succeed if everybody shows these competencies. Sometimes you have to have people which are totally different, and the combination is important. So, um, this is what I want you to, to understand about competency models. What are competency models? Why are they there? But I also want you to, to, to have a, a differentiated view on this kind of concept. Okay? I mean, most companies have this. If I ask HR directors, whom of you has a competency model in their company? All hands raise. Yeah? They all have this. So it's a very commonly used concept, but at the same time, um, we really must, be, uh, we have have, must have a differentiated view on this. So, now let's come to the first component, performance management. It's something really simple. In, German, in Germany, we also have this idea of Mitarbeitergespräch. Yeah? Whom of you knows this? Yeah, Mitarbeitergespräch. Once in a year, <coughs> your boss comes to you and says, Claudia, you know, it's January, we have to do our Mitarbeitergespräch, performance appraisal. What happens, as I already said, you talk about, primarily you talk about two different things. You talk about the past. This is the performance appraisal part. You talk about your performance in the previous 12 months. Okay? And the second part is you talk about the future. What are your objectives in the next 12 months? Okay? And there are two types of objectives, typically. One type of objective is about performance, really. What, what do we agree on what you need to achieve in the next 12 months? What are your future achievements, really? This is about the pure performance. And the other component is your development. Where will you get better in the next 12 months? Okay? Oh, yes, I should get better in project management. I should get better in English. I should get better. I should gain some international experience. Um, so these are the things to talk about. One, two hours. Okay? And uh, this is performance management. Why do companies do this? And I can tell you, 99% of all companies do this. And you will experience this in your career. Once you work somewhere, you will experience the performance appraisal. Yeah? Once in a year, talking about your performance and future objectives. You will experience the meetup at the <coughs> Why is it there? If you ask me, what is, the, what is the most commonly used concept in HR? And I would say, it's this. <laughs> Why is it there? Well, I would imagine by having to tell your boss uh, what went wrong, what went well, he's holding you accountable for what you're doing. And you know that you'll have to uh, look him, in, him or her in, in the face and tell him, well, this is where I went wrong, this is where I went, you know, where things went right. Okay. Possibly. Here's Maybe the point. And uh, once a year, you talk about what went well, what went right, mm -hmm. what should be improved. 
But be careful, it's not about what should be improved. Yeah? It's really about you. What should you improve? Okay? Where should you get better? Yeah? Or if you have the chance to give a feedback to the supervisor, you can tell the boss, I would like if you change your behavior in this direction. Mm -hmm. okay? It's not about uh, improving things in the department or so. It's, it's really about you as a person. Yeah? But, but nevertheless, it makes sense yeah, to have this time to talk about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I guess on the simplest level, just to show the boss you did something, maybe people with a very vague uh, job <laughs> yeah. description. Yeah. So yeah. what do you do? <laughs> okay, <laughs> to prove that you did something. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. Okay. Uh, in practice, I would agree. Yes, yeah. sometimes you have to tell your boss, "This is what I've achieved in the previous twelve months." Please no, notice this. Yeah. But I mean, that would be. Okay. Weird if this would be the ultimate purpose, or maybe it's a big team. No, not the ultimate, but maybe it's a big team, and your boss doesn't know exactly yeah. what to do at all times because you okay. just have a big team. Okay, I see. I see. Well, usually they they know what to do and also what they've done. If you've done something wrong, or if they have been positive, and if you have improved, if there are positive aspects that they have noticed, and. Um, we could also say it's, it's in some times if you're not really if you haven't done a lot of crappy things through the year it's mm -hmm. sometimes also motivation mm -hmm. because um, they don't uh, they do not only talk about your performance but they also say I like what you did there yeah. and they also give you the chance to improve probably because it's, they say well this did not really went well yeah and there's always a but. So, so, so you work 12 months and you are busy doing things and now there is this one point of time where you really think about this, where you reflect on what have I achieved, what, what will I achieve in the future, where should I get better, yeah? to have this point of time, this moment where you really sit back and think about it. Yeah? And, and you also have a, a common understanding with your boss that, that might be important. Yeah? Not that you think different than your boss with regards to your achievement yeah, and your future objectives. Yeah. There should be a kind of common understanding. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, for us, it was also uh, very important when we see the objective setting. So what do you want to do? Not just, um, not just on uh, how do you want your job to be like, how do you want to do the, your job or what did you understand through the year? What is better that you do this job in this way because this is going to be better? But also, where do you imagine yourself to be? Because this helped us to find, are you really in the right position or should we really move you like a little bit within the same level but somewhere else because you're not really good with this or this is yes. not what you're looking for? Yeah. Yes, yes. But there is, a, there is a point of view of your manager. This is what you should do. And there are some things where you think, these are the things I would like to do. Uh, and to, to coordinate this, to find a common understanding, that's also one purpose. Absolutely agree. Yeah? Maybe it's a good opportunity to ask for a raise or a promotion. Because yeah. you, you can tell your boss, look at this, yeah. I did this and this and this and this and this, I'm so good. You How talk you about your perspective, your future. I want to get promoted. Yeah, I want to have more money. Yeah? I would like to work less. <laughs> I want to change the team. I would like to do a different job. And this is the moment where you talk about these things. Absolutely. So on this packed slide, it's over you about the major purposes of this very simple concept. And one idea is that, you know, I mean, think about a company with, let's say, 10,000 employees. 10,000 employees that produce something. I mean, how can you make sure that the 10,000 people work in a way that at the end you can sell a car <laughs> or something, a phone? Okay. So how can you orchestrate the 10,000 people organizing these different departments in a way that they all move towards one direction? I mean, that's, that was always... A critical question when we talk about organizational science. 
how can we lead organizations? How can we structure things? How can we make that the individual contribution of each and every individual adds some value to one big thing? And that's why we have this idea of cascading objectives. Yeah? There is an overall objective saying we want to increase revenue by 10% in the next year. This decision is done by the, by, by, the, by the executive board on top level. But what does that mean for the different countries? What does this mean for the individual salesperson? Okay? And through performance management, you try to cascade this down. Okay, overall 10%. What does that mean for Asia Pacific? Here is the regional director. Well, Asia Pacific has huge potential. You make 15, while in Europe we only make 5% increase in, in revenue. So you make 15. What does that mean for China? In China there is less potential, though you make 12. What does that mean for a different sales team in China? For your team in Shanghai, you make 11. And then what does that mean for the individual salesperson? So you try to break down yeah, objectives from top to bottom. And the performance management meeting, performance appraisal, objective setting is there to define these from top to bottom. That's the simple idea. And then what I already said, it's to align the people, to align the team, that, that they all work into, into, towards one, one direction. And one thing we, we already discussed, it's about clarity between you and your supervisor. Do we have the same understanding about why I am there? Do we have the same expectations about my work? Yeah. Does my boss really think that I'm doing well? <laughs> yeah? Or so this is this is about clarity, mutual expectations. And then it's about continuous learning continuous improvement of performance. So, you get a feedback. No, Bernd, I think you didn't do well. Overall, it was fine, but, you know, there is one area where you really need to improve. Yeah. I have experienced you in different settings, and I really saw that, that you must improve your project management skills. We had this project and you did not fail, but there were some issues. Uh, mm. And there and there, so, so you get some feedback, that's the idea. And then, of course, performance management is a foundation for other processes. We spoke about variable pay, right? We talked about variable pay, pay for performance. So if you pay for performance, if the salary the people get depend on their performance, you have to talk about performance, okay? You have to tell the people, you know, you have overachieved. You have achieved 110% of what we agreed. So you get 110% of your target bonus. So if you pay for performance, you have to talk about it. So this is, this is an overview why this, uh, this concept is there. It's a very important concept. It's a very important concept, not only in HR, it's also important in, in, in leadership. And companies use forms for this. Right? This is a real example. Yeah, here you can, you can uh, write down the objectives. You can make some mid-year review. You can uh, build a development plan. What are the two, three, five things you will do to develop certain skills? Typically, you have an overall performance rating. Uh, very often, specific competencies are evaluated. So how is your team ability? How is your strategic thinking? How is your result orientation? Um, so th in my eyes, this is a very complicated form. <laughs> yeah? It looks a little bit bureaucratic. What I like... I personally, is if people would have one page, the upper half and the lower half. On the upper half, you write down, what are the three things I want to achieve in the upcoming year? What are the three things I want to be proud of yeah, in 12 months? 
these three things I simply write down and it makes sense. I do it personally also every year. I do not share this with anybody. Well, I think about what do I want to achieve in the next year? What do I want to achieve in 2013? And the lower half is just about where do I want to get better? What are the one, two things where I want to get better? If you have this very simple and you talk about this once a year or you do it for yourself, that makes really sense. So whether it really must be really that structured, I'm not sure. Uh, let me add one point um, here with the competencies. If I ask you, how are you, uh, um, are you a team player? Whom of you is a team player? You don't need to raise your hand, but if you think about yourself, am I a team player? On a range from one very basic to four excellent, where, where am I? Or ask yourself, how strong are you in communication? Uh, on one to four, hmm. you immediately feel that it's, it's really hard. Right? It's really hard. Am I a two or a three? So that's why companies, uh, this is an example from Microsoft, have so-called behaviorally anchored rating scales. And these scales help to really find the right level. So level one means um, keeps people informed and up to date, follows through on commitments made to other team members, I mean, that's really basic. We could, not, we could not imagine a level below this would be kind of autistic or so. Mm. Nerdy. <laughs> well, here, level four, you see things like builds highly productive teams from highly diverse disciplines, cultural organizations. Wow. <laughs> masterfully integrates people and resources to achieve high levels of synergy, resolves dysfunctional conflict within or among teams to ensure business success. Now, if I ask you again, where are you? <laughs> From one to four, most of you will say, I definitely meet one. Some of you already struggle with level two. <laughs> level three, it's very, that, that's already Champions League, right? And this is, this is huge. Companies use this, yeah, or something like this, to 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 make clear what they mean with the different levels. Okay. It's very simple. Yeah, it's easy to explain. I could explain performance yeah. management in a minute, and we immediately find some reasons why performance management is there. But as with competency models, why things are so clear and it seemed to be so reasonable on first sight. Also here, I would like to add some what-ifs. <laughs> um, what if employee and manager talk about relevant aspects on a daily basis? Anyhow, we talk about things on a daily basis, about performance, about what is relevant for the future, you give a, get, a, get a feedback on a daily basis. Why the hell should you have this one meeting in a year where you talk about these things? There are managers who don't talk to their people. Uh, uh, they don't talk about with their people uh, throughout the year. Yeah? If manager and employee do not talk, 12 months, they will not be able to talk at one single moment. Yeah? Um, is it fair to give a feedback on a project on, on a certain occasion always on January uh, should you give a feedback at the moment when the feedback was necessary and when it was valid yeah. can managers really give feedback they should be able to do so, but, but you will experience this uh, with your manager or when you will become a manager. To give a negative feedback is one of the hardest things to do. Yeah? Especially when you have a close relation to your employee. Yeah? If you act like partners, like friends, 
Yeah. Do you rate your friend on a scale from one to five? Hey, Bernd, uh, we drink beer together, we work together, everything fine. No, I rate you, I give you a four. <laughs> hey, silly. <laughs> yeah. The superior objectives are not clear. How can we break down objectives if they are not clear on the top? And this is very often the case. It's not clear why we, why we should do this. I mean, um, or the manager primarily used, the, uh, used to act like a coach, not like a judge. That's a difference between I, I give you feedback, I, I, I help you to structure things, but I don't judge you, I don't give you a grade. Yeah, yeah, that that has an impact on your future career. Or there is already a natural relation between manager and employee built on trust and respect. I mean, with your spouse, with your partner, do you have an annual meeting? They sit together. Okay, now let's have this annual partner <laughs> meeting. Let's talk about what we jointly want to achieve in next year. Where should I get better? Where should you get better? Do you do this? No, I mean, come on, that's silly. You do this every time, hopefully. Yeah. Very often, the manager does not have really insights into the work of their people. They think about professional, professional service firms, consulting companies. The people, they work in projects somewhere in the world. They don't experience what they do on a daily basis. Yeah. How can I give a feedback? How can I do a performance appraisal if I, I don't have an insight into daily work of my people? And some people don't have really understanding about, about the work of the people. Yeah, I told this last time. Um, many employees in, in knowledge-intense industries, the employees, the employees have a much better expertise about what they do than their managers. Then how can the manager review the work of their people. If I'm a software developing manager and my, and my software developer tell me, well, I need 20 days to develop this, very often I can't tell whether this is reasonable or not. Maybe it would be possible in a day. Maybe 80 days would be reasonable. I don't know. I just have to rely on it. Yeah? Objectives change over the year. Things are not that constant, not that, not that static. Okay? What if employees do not really trust their managers? That could happen. And again, while things look very easy, performance management, objective setting, performance appraisal, in reality, sometimes it feels kind of silly, useless. Uh, things are not clear to the people why they do this. So uh, This just gives an impression of why things are not always that easy as we think of.